All right, so Lionair JT610, uh, we've heard a lot about this uh, this accident in, in the press. And uh, tonight we're going to give you our perspective on this um, fatal loss controlling flight uh, incident. So the background to it is, as you know, Lionair JT610 departed uh, Sakano Harta International Airport in Indonesia on uh, the 29th of October 2018 at 6.20 in the morning. And as the aircraft passed through 2,000 feet above uh, ground level during the initial climb out then, there was a rapid uh, nose down uh, pitching motion of the aircraft. At 6.42, the aircraft crashed into the sea with uh, an excess of 400 knots um, through airspeed. And unfortunately, all 189 persons on board uh, lost their lives in this incident. And this is a classical loss of control in flight accident, as they call it. And uh, tonight we're going to give some definition uh, into what loss of control in flight is. Uh, it has been the number one fatal accident category uh, for the past 60 years. It is evolving and, cha and changing as, as technology changes. Um, so aircraft have obviously seen significant development uh, over this period. Um, however, the Lockheed accident rate, although declining, still persists. It's still a problem that uh, we need to address. Um, so, the contents. We're going to have a look at the definition of loss of control. If I just explain what that is. One of the main focuses of tonight's presentation is on the human in the loop. A loss of control in flight is a human in the loop problem in a crewed bit. We're going to give a design engineer's viewpoint on the design of the 737 MAX 8. And at that point, I'll hand over to Niels, who's going to talk about the, uh, the background of the accident flight itself based on the, the facts from the, uh, the report. And Niels, as a, um, as a 737 pilot who's, who's flown uh, the, uh, the Max 8 simulator, uh, is going to give us uh, the pilot viewpoint. Again, human factors, human in the loop. Uh, then uh, we'll have a quick look at the official accident report and the findings and the safety recommendations that came out of that, followed by Q&A. And as, as Neil said earlier, um, please post your questions via the Q&A. And whilst I'm presenting, uh, Niels will, uh, will uh, try to answer them. And whilst uh, Niels is presenting, I will try to answer questions as well. So we'll try and keep the, uh, the Q&A going. So, as I said, loss of control in flight is the fatal accident category uh, most prominent. And uh, this is a um, a statistical graph produced by IATA. It's quite a recent one from 2019. On the vertical axis here, we can see the accident frequencies uh, and on the horizontal axis, the fatality uh, risk. We can see that loss of control in flight is the most uh, lethal um, type of accident category um, according to the IATA statistics. So there, are, there aren't a significant number of loss of control in flight accidents, but when they happen, unfortunately, lots of people lose their lives. So, in this particular graph, we're talking about full, uh, full hull loss and uh, fatal accidents, not non fatals So, loss of control in flight, then, a classic definition is, uh, is when the flight crew is unable to maintain control, maintain control of the aircraft in flight resulting in an unrecoverable deviation from the intended flight path. Now, as a flight safety researcher, this isn't an entirely helpful description. So, um, some years ago, we set about uh, redefining loss of control in flight to better understand the, the shape and form it takes in order for us to identify safety interventions. I mentioned that we would um, cover some basics in the human factors arena. And with regards to human in the loop, I said loss of control in flight is a human in the loop uh, challenge. 
um, statistics uh, produced by uh, Jacques, Jacques Drapier of, of Airbus uh, some time ago um, suggested that a typical long haul pilot flies around 800 hours a year. And of that time, around three hours of hands on stick time. So most of the pilot's flying experience is in the middle or outer loop. So in this case, uh, we're looking at the, the outer loop control of the aircraft using navigation flight management or the uh, MCDU. But just to explain this uh, in a little more detail, then the uh, pilot puts uh, actions and control inputs into the MCDU. That controls the autopilot, the flight director, which in turn controls the systems of the aircraft, modifying the uh, control surfaces to maneuver the aircraft, um, and the uh, stability augmentation systems, systems on board the aircraft, put in some, some compensation uh, to the, uh, the control actions. Typically then, the resultant motion of the aircraft um, is then sensed by the pilot, and it takes about 60 seconds from the input to the output. So the human pilot is sensing the, the situation and surroundings using the sensory cues, visual, oral, tactile, and so on, putting some perception on what those senses are telling them, then making decisions, and then taking actions. The second most common um, method of managing the flight is uh, the use of the autopilot. So in this scenario, similarly, the pilot makes makes uh, inputs into the autopilot, which in turn um, inputs the control systems, the aircraft, and so on. And in the autopilot, the flight director mode, then typically the time between uh, input and output is around 15 seconds. Now, when the automation um, is uh, switched off, um, as in the case of many loss of control in flight accidents, then um, the pilot is, uh, is conducting manual control, manual flying skills, uh, and uh, providing uh, inputs to the control systems through the primary and secondary flight controls, which in turn, again, control the or move the control surfaces, which maneuver the aircraft, and uh, typically that can be about a 0.5 second um, delay if we're talking about primary controls. So clearly secondary controls like engines who spool up time is a, a, a significantly longer delay. So the pilot is in sensing, perceiving, deciding, acting, and then making appropriate control efforts. Breaking that down then, a manual control in the aircraft uh, to uh, a lower level this is an illustration taken from uh, flight test uh, and the qualities uh, papers by Cooper and Hoff. It's uh, reasonably dated, but still holds very true and is a good, a good method of understanding what's happening. So the pilot here is given a primary task to perform. The pilot makes uh, control inputs, uh, modifying the surfaces, which, which alter the stability control characteristics of the aircraft. Reflecting the elevator, introduces a change in the tail lift, which uh, in turn the tail lift force times the distance from the center of gravity uh, introduces a moment to the aircraft. So pitches up the aircraft or pitches down the aircraft. So the aircraft moves and then hopefully achieves the desired task performance. There are several uh, um, other additional inputs to this that uh, need to be considered. So stress, distraction, disturbance and so on can affect the pilot's performance. Uh, the aircraft state can be affected by um, mass and balance uh, changes, shifting in weight. Um, it can also be affected by uh, a change in state in terms of uh, dynamic failures. So a failure of one ailer on one side and, and not on the other, for example, can introduce uh, rolling at the moment. And in addition to this, then, the aircraft movement can also be affected by the environmental state. So the uh, weather conditions, wind shear, turbulence, and so on. With respect, then, to the human factors, as you can see here, there are multiple feedback loops. 
That's very good. Manual control. So the pilot is receiving visual cues. So I mentioned earlier sensing, perception, decision, and action. Pilot is receiving visual cues, external cues from the natural horizon in favorable weather um, to gauge the um, attitude and uh, alignment of the wings of the aircraft. Internal cues coming from um, the instrumentation. Oral cues coming from the engine noise or the external airflow outside of the aircraft. Motion cues, so balance and acceleration through uh, acceleration and movement of the aircraft in, in, uh, in three different axes. Also, right at the heart of all of this are the tactile and proprioceptive cues, sometimes called haptic cues. So these are stick force cues, stick displacement, and stick vibration. Um, you'll notice that these cues are in a very small closed loop system here, all on their own. So these cues are coming directly from the flight controls when we talk about force displacement and uh, stick shakers, for example. So these, these cues are felt uh, very quickly, whereas the other ones go through a, um, a series of uh, processes before they are evident to the final motion of the egg. So we take that concept then to a, um, a, a crew arrangement where we have a pilot flying and a pilot monitoring, so PF pilot flying, PM pilot monitoring. In the cockpit environment then, we have um, two crew situation, we have um, crew working together and uh, sensing uh, visual, oral, uh, and tactile proprioceptive cues uh, from the aircraft. So in this case, the pilot flying here has direct a connection with the aircraft through the tactile and proprioceptive cues. But he's also receiving, so this is two-way communication, force, you know, force in, applying force and, and position on the stick, but receiving uh, feedback as to, um, as to the um, intended uh, actions. Um, so the pilot is, is, is receiving, the pilot flying, receiving these uh, visual and oral cues, peripheral and uh, central. But the pilot monitoring, however, is, is not getting the same um, proprioceptive cues uh, since um, the hands are off the controls. We can, however, obviously observe the motion of the, uh, the control yoke in a uh, traditional commercial aircraft with um, um, so in addition to this, there are um, cues coming from the external world, the external environment, as well as the cabin environment themselves. So one of the interesting things to note here is that in, in uh, most aircraft we have um, duplicated displays, so primary flight display, nav display on the left, and we have one on the right hand side as well. But when those instruments show different information, then they're providing different cues, different visual cues to the pilot flying and the pilot monitoring. So when we have a discrepancy in the display of information on either side, then that can affect the combined situation and state awareness of the aircraft. So unexpected events, uh, we mentioned the um, um, lots of controlling quite often involves uh, automation, uh, coming out of automation into, into manual flight with a, with a 60 second to a, 30, a 0.5 second um, uh, difference between input and output. So unexpected events then can lead to startle and surprise, or a combination of startle and surprise. Um, startle events are uh, reflex actions and Occur as a response to a sudden high intensity stimulus. So, something suddenly happening, a, a loud bang, a knock, something happening in the cockpit environment. They're very rare events, um, whereas uh, in, in, in startle terms, a disruption can last anything from 100 milliseconds up to around 10 seconds. Surprise um, is uh, can be elicited by 
presence of something unexpected happening or the absence of something expected. If you expect something to be there and it's not there, um, that can have a, a, an equally uh, disruptive effect on on the um, understanding of the situation and the mental model. So uh, the disruption time for surprise is is uh, much greater than startle, so more than 10 seconds. Now, both of these reactions then um, uh, result in, in psychophysiological uh, responses. So the startle response is an involuntary reflex, so a fight or flight type of reaction. And that can be characterized by a rapid blinking of the eyes, significant increase in heart rate, heart rate variability, muscle tension and grabbing the controls and freezing. Emotional response is, is common as well. And in addition to that, cognitive tunneling. So, so focusing on one thing and um, doing that to the expense of using other sensory channels and cues. Surprise uh, can relate can uh, result in heart rate increase lesser than um, startle effect. Blood pressure can go up. Emotions are, are present as well, and typically the working memory can be impaired. Um, so the result of all this is that uh, as um, with, with highly automated systems, then if they provide limited or no feedback. Um, transfer or limit the control to the pilot unexpectedly, then this can cause surprise or even startle. So that was uh, sort of uh, the, the prelims on um, the, the human factors um, aspects that I hope will become apparent and why, why these are relevant as we, uh, we explain the, uh, the accident from our perspective. So the background then to, to uh, the 737 at Max 8, but really um, in terms of the external environment, highly competitive, uh, Airbus had introduced uh, the new Airbus A320neo and it looked like Airbus sales uh, were projected to, uh, to overtake uh, Boeing. Um, the Max had uh, at the time of um, the Lion Air JT610 accident, it had only been in service for, for a short period. Um, and really with the family product uh, concept, the, uh, the design ethos was, um, as with many aircraft manufacturers, to retain as much commonality as possible with the 737 models uh, in order to minimize the training conversion time. An attractive proposition for any airline. So um, the aircraft design also included uh, some other new background systems, um, such as MCAS. So the conversion then from the uh, the NG model to the MAX then was uh, regarded as differences training uh, only, and that meant that uh, pilots wishing to convert uh, would undertake a course of uh, computer-based training. Um, and no simulator time was required for uh, for the uh, the differences training or conversion. Uh, typically, this could be done in two days uh, or less uh, for the flight crew. So that's the background. Um, now let's have a look at the specific design changes. So the, the design changes um, were, uh, were focused uh, around a uh, more efficient uh, engine, producing 14% uh, less uh, less fuel burn than, uh, than the NG. And uh, that required uh, larger engine nacelles to accommodate the new engine. Um, this, by the way, is an illustration of uh, the very first um, model of the 737. Uh, first flight happened in, uh, in April 1967, so 54 years ago. Um, so the introduction of these these new cells. Let me just superimpose now the uh, the uh, Max version. So the Max um, uh, 
engines uh, moving forward and upwards uh, to provide better ground clearance because of the larger size um, had some impact on the uh, the aerodynamics of the aircraft and the net effect was that it reduced what we call the longitudinal static stability of the aircraft at high angles of attack it introduced 8 to 18 percent more thrust as well so more thrust with um, low slung engine pilots application of the thrust um, results in an increased aircraft nose up um, movement particularly when accelerating so you can see there's some significant differences here obviously from the uh, the very uh, first 727 um, Within uh, loss of control of flight, um, it's, it's important to understand uh, the um, relationship to, to angle of attack. So often loss of control of flight is characterized by, by um, unusual attitudes um, or um, uh, an exceedance of a uh, critical angle of attack resulting in a stall. So um, the angle of attack of the aircraft is basically the difference between where the aircraft is pointing and where the aircraft is actually going, the resultant motion. So the resultant motion of the aircraft is typically known as the flight path angle, whereas the direction in which the aircraft is pointing is the pitch angle. So the angle of attack is simply the difference between the two. With regards to the introduction of um, the, uh, the larger engines, this is a, a, a theoretical slide, and I promise there's only one equation in this presentation. It's rather a complicated one. But uh, the net effect of this is that, um, here's our pitching moment. The pitching moment is, is the, is, is the, is the uh, moment pitching the aircraft up. So positive is pitching the aircraft up. Um, the effect of these nacelles is that as the airflow hits the nacelle at a, uh, a high um, pitch attitude, the greater the angle through which the airflow has to move from the inlet to the outlet, the greater the reactive force here. The reactive force then being ahead of the center of gravity of the aircraft causes the aircraft to pitch up. So the pitch moment increases with the distance of the inlet forward of the CG. So here's our CG, here's our inlet. So as XJ increases, our pitch moment increases. It's also the pitch attitude here. So as the pitch attitude increases, the pitch moment increases. So um, at higher angles of attack and high attitude angles, then um, there's a greater pitch up moment. So things get worse as you get higher. In terms of the pitch attitude. Um, in relation to, to stalls then and, uh, and loss of control, this is a sort of um, um, illustrative example of aircraft flying in a normal sort of flight range of angle of attack and lift coefficient and uh, abnormal situation in loss of control in flight. So typically in normal flight, the aircraft will be flying with an angle of attack of about 0 to 10 degrees. Beyond 10 degrees, the, these figures, by the way, change with different aircraft types and design and wing, uh, wing air force sections. So, as I said, it's just representative. In the amber region, then, uh, as the angle of attack increases beyond 10 up to around 16 degrees, the unsteady effects become apparent. So we, we see buffet in the wing. Uh, we might even have wing drop or wing rock. So the pitch stability, the instability in pitch with higher pitch attitude starts to introduce lateral and directional stability challenges as well. And um, that can result in a, in a no slice um, departure from control flight. So in the amber region then, at, uh, at the first lift peak, we can move into the, um, um, the red region here, 
where we have a, a sudden loss of lift and uh, pore poising um, and loss of longitudinal directional stability and adverse yaw. And then that can lead to deep stall and post stall gyrations. Now, as I said, different aircraft have different characteristics here. So this is a this is a, a two peak um, characteristic. Some aircraft have a one peak characteristic with a with a much extended um, peak um, in, at a higher and lower attack. So this is not common. It's just illustrative. The main point of this is to say that there is a region clearly where the aircraft is in control. And there is clearly a region where the aircraft might be out of control in pitch roll and your. But there is a region here in, 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 uh, in between them where control is diminished but is still recoverable. Um, looking at then the angle of attack and pitostatic installation for uh, the particular aircraft uh, in question, then. Um, the MAX, like many other Boeings, has two AOAs, one on each side of the aircraft, the nose of the aircraft. And um, they're measuring the angle between where the aircraft is pointing and where the aircraft is going, simply speaking. Um, for the MAX aircraft, there are two flight control uh, computers. The data is sent to the flight control computers. And it's one per side, but the MAX is designed to rely on only one of its two flight control computers per flight, alternating from one to the other after each flight. As a result, then, the MCAS then receives data from just one AOA sensor per flight. Obviously, we're talking about the, um, the situation before the, uh, the lion in the accident to the Ethiopian Airlines. So we'll come back to this point later. So so I think we've probably just about covered this, but why is NCAS needed? Well, um, the, the, the sort of design uh, driver for this was uh, to enhance the pitch stability so that the aircraft feels like other 737s in terms of its uh, flying and qualities. And this is a, just an illustration of um, uh, the, the point at which we start to move into um, the uh, reduced control region. So when an aircraft is stable, this is a graph of uh, lift coefficient and the vertical axis versus angle of attack and the horizontal axis. So here's our typical lift peak that we saw earlier, first peak here. Um, this blue line is the pitching moment, the variation of pitching moment with the angle of attack. And having a negative gradient is a good thing. So what this means is that, uh, see here, here's our trim flight condition. So we're, where there are no resultant pitching moments on the aircraft, trimmed nicely here. As we increase angle of attack, then the pitching moment, you can see here, starts to get more negative. So what that does is it, it pulls the uh, nose of the aircraft down. As the angle of attack decreases from trim, it becomes more positive. As the angle of attack decreases, then the aircraft will nose up naturally. So negative gradient is a good thing. However, in this case, when the angle of attack reaches a certain level, um, there is a reversal in the moment. This is not a good thing. So here, this this is tending towards a positive gradient now, but as the angle of attack increases, the positive pitching moment also increases. So this is this is um, negative static stability, and will result in the aircraft nose pitching up even further. So that concludes the first part of the presentation on the, on the human factors and uh, the design engineer's viewpoint. Um, at this point now, I'm going to hand over to uh, to Niels, to um, uh, take it uh, through um, MCAS and, uh, and and beyond. Good. 
just start my uh, my show here. One second. Seem to have just gone back to the, uh, the beginning. I'll uh, just uh, wind myself back up. Here we are. Okay. So um, central to this accident and central to the, all the discussions uh, around the, the 737 Max uh, are the um, manoeuvring characteristics augmentation system MCAS. And uh, Mike has explained why that system uh, was required in Boeing's opinion and uh, this is what it does. Um, so it's really all about generating a pitch down in certain circumstances, and those circumstances are when an AOA or uh, angle of attack reaches a certain value, um, and uh, that's related to a, a Mach number as well, and that dictates the size of the, the input that the computer will make to the aircraft controls. So um, MCAS um, controls the, uh, the stabilizer, and it'll move the stabilizer up, so leading edge up, but that results in an aircraft nose down, um, stable, uh, aircraft nose down uh, uh, movement, uh, reduced pitch attitude and reducing pitch attitude then will um, decrease AOA back into that normal flight regime that Mike was talking about. So, uh, sorry, Niels, is, is, um, is the slide showing? Uh, I just yeah, it is for me. It may not be for you. Let me just start. Let me just see if that is. Uh... Thanks for uh, bringing that to my attention. So the, uh, the MCAS will activate automatically. It's an automatic system, doesn't require any decision on behalf of any of the crew. And it uh, activates when it senses angle of attack crossing a certain threshold. Um, it'll only do that when uh, the autopilot isn't engaged. Um, it's, I think the presumption now would be that, that the automatics will not uh, do anything that would result in an AOA that high. Um, this is really about manual flight, so when the autopilot's off, the AOA crosses a certain value, and the flaps are up too, um, which is presumably to do with the flight characteristics. That's uh, those three conditions need to be true, and when that when they are, MCAS will fire. Um, it will fire um, and um, move the trim in a nose down direction, um, and it will do that at one, at one of the two speeds that the 737 trim moves at. So there are two speeds for the 737 trim and um, it moves at the higher of the two speeds. It's a fixed fixed um, speed for the MCAS and it moves the trim at 0.4 units a second. A, a unit um, on the 737 is equivalent to a degree of stabiliser uh, movement. So it, it's about 0.4 degrees a second that it's moving that, which is a reasonably fast rate. I'll show you in a minute uh, what that looks like uh, in the flight day. Um, how long it goes for depends on Mach number and the actual angle of attack at the time. It's got a, a, a maximum authority built into the control or two, um, and at the, uh, at the lowest speed and highest Mach in the envelope, um, it's got up to two and a half units, up to two and a half degrees of uh, stabiliser movement available, and that means around about a six-second burst of trim um, at high speed is uh, what it will uh, what it will fire for. So, um, two and a half units doesn't sound like an awful lot, um, but um, it is actually quite significant, and I'll show you that when we come to uh, to look at the, the stabiliser trim scale in detail shortly. Um, Apologies, Niels. The uh, the screen is is in is not in presenter mode. It's in um, PowerPoint. Um. Okay. Uh, 
How's that? Hold on. Excellent. Got it now? Okay. So if I do that, yep. we should we should have moved on a slide. Is that the case for you? Super job. Okay. Technology is a wonderful thing, just proving the human factors going on here this evening, clearly. Um, so if we think about the accident flyers, Mike mentioned it departed 6.20 uh, a.m. local time. Um, in this particular uh, uh, case, the aircraft had suffered a number of defects over the preceding days, some of which were uh, very similar uh, to what happened to the crew on the accident flight. Um, they were dealt with in a different way by those crews such that uh, the aircraft made it to the other end uh, in one piece. Um, uh, and that's not saying that the crew on JT610 were uh, deficient in some way. It's just a proof that um, the, the humans and the decisions that the humans make on board um, are, are central to how things can turn out. Um, the aircraft in this case took off, it generated several alerts, the stick shaker went off, various other things happened fairly shortly, within the first few seconds after takeoff really. Um, and as Mike mentioned, as it uh, passed through 2,000 feet, which is not, not that long after takeoff, um, there was an uncommanded pitch down, so that, as in the pilots didn't command uh, a pitch down, something in the aircraft did. Um, the crew managed to maintain control. Uh, the captain was pilot flying, the first officer was pilot monitoring, and they managed to maintain control somewhat, um, as in the aircraft was flying, it was maintaining a reasonable speed, it was you know, in a, operating in a band of altitude, but it was, uh, certainly you wouldn't say it was out of control, and it, they managed that for about 10 minutes as they tried to understand uh, really quite a complex situation that was in front of them. And... Um, the problem was that, that as, as that situation unfolded, it got quite difficult to deal with, and um, therefore the success that they had in uh, maintaining control of the aircraft um, was gradually decreasing, and the flight data recorder evidence showed that. Um, so around about 10 minutes later, or just before that point, the captain had been flying just before that point, um, he handed control to the first officer, and uh, as we'll see in the flight data recorder um, evidence that, the, that when the control was handed over, uh, the first officer dealt with the control of the aircraft less successfully than the captain had been doing. And um, uh, that in combination with uh, what MCAS was doing at the time meant that they had um, a, a large uh, pitch down input that the first officer was unable to arrest and that's what caused the terminal dive into the sea. So I'd like you to put yourself in these pilot shoes. It's not a pleasant place to be. Um, I guess it is a, um, a thing that we often do when all of us watch air crash investigation or anything things like that, is we sort of imagine what it would be like to be on, on the flight deck. And maybe if we're pilots ourselves, we'd think about whether we would um, do any better or what we would have done instead or that kind of thing. So um, I guess maybe we have had a more traditional view, uh, what Sidney Decker calls the old view of human factors, which is really that it's, it's our inadequacies as human beings that is what causes accidents. If only we were perfect, there wouldn't be any accidents. And actually the key to it is to find um, what the pilot did that was wrong um, and uh, therefore we should do that, not do that the next time, or just, you know, remonstrate with the pilot if they survived and say you should do that better next time, and um, uh, that, will, uh, that will lead to fewer accidents. That hasn't been terribly successful in moving the debate on so far, and uh, Decker argues that there should be a newer view, and I quite like this view, is that um, when a human being, be a pilot or anybody, or a designer indeed, uh, of an aircraft or a regulator or all kinds of people involved in this uh, particular accident, but um, when a human makes an error, uh, it, it's not a cause of an accident, it's a symptom of trouble further inside, the deeper inside a system. And I guess now with hindsight, we all know the bigger picture of max uh, accidents, and that's probably true. Um, 
when we're thinking about the accident itself, though, rather than dealing with what the pilot should have done, which is often obvious after the event, but definitely not obvious to the pilot at the time, um, it's much more interesting to ask the question, why did the pilot do what they did when they did? Because we can generally work on the assumption that, that the crew did, wanted to go home at the end of their duty. They didn't intend to have an accident, certainly didn't intend to die. And so they must have been trying their best. They must have been trying to do what they thought was the best thing to do in that situation at the time. And if we understand why what they were doing made sense to them, that might give us much more of an insight into um, uh, what we can do so that they make a, a different crew would make a different decision uh, if it were to happen again. So when you put yourself in these pilot shoes, think about that. Don't think about, well, obviously, if, if uh, pilot A had done such and such, wouldn't have crashed. Think more about why did pilot A do what he did uh, in this particular circumstance. So I'd like to um, show you some of the things that, that this crew was having to deal with. So I'll have a quick tour of the 737 cockpit. This is an NG, but the, um, uh, the uh, MAX is very similar, and certainly this part of the aircraft is uh, pretty much identical. Um, so here's the, the, the throttle quadrant, and um, in front of us here is the, uh, the stabiliser trim wheel. Um, you can just see the edge of the one on the first officer's side just behind the, uh, the thrust levers on the uh, right-hand side there. So there's two trim wheels um, for the stabiliser right in the middle uh, of the uh, flight deck on the 737. Um, very prominent, and um, they make quite a loud noise when they move, uh, so they're, they're quite an obvious part of the furniture in there. Um, these two switches uh, control uh, the electrics to the stabiliser trim, so we've got two options for moving the stabiliser in a 737. You can either move it electrically with the motor, or you can move it manually. Um, if you see the, the trim wheel there has a, has a handle uh, that you can fold out and you can literally um, move the wheel, which moves all the same cables and moves the stabiliser, so you can move it manually. Uh, in a 737, which is not true of all airliners, um, but it is on, on the 73. Um, just like a small aircraft, it's uh, cable operated. So uh, the manual trim is always available. Um, and uh, if you want to turn the electric trim off, um, you can turn one of or both of those two switches off, the stamp trim cutout switches. Here's a close-up of, uh, of the stamp trim. And... Um, you can see there's a scale by it and a little pointer and that moves, <coughs> excuse me, whether the um, stabiliser trim is moving electrically or uh, being trimmed manually. Uh, a typical uh, departure trim would be somewhere between five and six stabiliser trim units. Um, and um, so that's where you can see it here. The, the, um, the stabiliser is at uh, zero degrees when, um, uh, when it's at four on this scale. So it can move about four degrees aircraft uh, nose down and about 12 degrees aircraft nose up so that the stabilizer in total has a range of movement of about 17 degrees and that corresponds to the 17 units that are on this scale. So if you remember when I said MCAS has a two and a half unit um, uh, uh, authority depending on Mach number and um, uh, angle of attack you can see that in only two of the maximum bursts if you're at five on takeoff you could end up at the, at the full nose down stop in a couple of bursts, so you know, two six second bursts, and you're at the forward stop. Um, so um, yeah, it's 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 got quite a lot of authority, really, is the conclusion. Here's a close up of the stab trim switches. You've got one on the left, which is the main electric cutout, and that will cut out the um, the electric trim switches that are on the control wheels, and the autopilot uh, stab trim cutout cuts out the uh, electrical signals from the autopilot, the autoflight system. Uh, to the stab trim if you still want to retain use of the, uh, the control wheel switches. And um, there's an example, this is the captain's side of, uh, of the control wheel stab trim switches. There's actually two switches, one next to each other, you've got to move them both together um, up and down uh, to uh, trim the, uh, the stab nose down or nose up. So it's right by your left thumb if you're a captain, your right thumb if you're a first officer, uh, on the top of the control wheel. 
Um, so those are your options uh, for, for, uh, for trimming. Um, this is a video uh, which I'll press play on in a second. Hopefully you'll get the sound. Um, and um, it shows to begin with, I'm just running a test here, but it shows to begin with the, uh, the stabilizer trim moving at the higher of the two speeds that it moves at electrically. So it's moving at 0.4 units a second, and this is the same speed that MCAS will trim the aircraft at. Um, when you counteract MCAS by using your thumb switch, you can only trim when the flaps are up, because remember that's when MCAS works. Uh, it doesn't work when the flaps are down. So when the flaps are up, uh, and you activate your trim switch as a pilot, you can only move uh, the trim at half that speed. So this shows the trim wheel moving at the MCAS speed, and then you'll see the change as it moves to half speed, which is the speed that you can counteract it with. So let's see if the sound works. So there it is at full speed. Can you hear the sound? Yeah, okay. There it goes at half speed. So if MCAS fires at 0.4 units a second, you'll have to trim, if you want to counteract the trim and offset the things that MCAS has done, for if, you, if that's your intention, then you need to trim for twice as long as MCAS does. And if you manage to learn that quickly in the situation, that you need to hold the trim, nose, or apply nose up trim twice as long as it's applying nose down trim, the net result will be zero and you'll presumably stay. If you were trimmed to begin with, you'll be back in trim again. So that's the key to winning the argument with MCAS. And that's where the crew of the line or well, the captain managed to do that quite successfully. Um, and you can see how he learns that that's, that's the answer uh, to offsetting whatever it is that's causing this uh, out of trim condition. Um, but the first officer doesn't learn that and that's why uh, the pitch down uh, is what wins the day. So, in the situation, in these pilot shoes that we're in, there was clearly some confusion shortly after takeoff. Um, the crew noted some uh, airspeed differences and some altitude differences between left and right, and as Mike explained earlier, that already starts to put something of a dividing line up between uh, the two pilots as to what they're seeing and therefore how they'll interpret what the aircraft is doing and what the situation is. So there's already some differences in diagnosis perhaps happening there. Um, on the 737, um, the NG, uh, there's a system called Speed Trim. And it basically, it's, it's a little bit like MCAS. It's a, it's a, a, a stabilizer trim input that happens at certain phases of flight, you'll often see it most on, uh, on takeoff, and um, it helps the pilot to uh, stay at the uh, trimmed speed or the commanded speed. Um, so the upshot of it is that you're quite used to the stabilizer trim making uncommanded by you, uh, uncommanded movements as you climb out after takeoff. Um, it won't move much, it's not got a huge amount of authority, the speed trim, but it, you are certainly used to hearing that trim wheel moving around uh, after takeoff, and particularly as you put the flaps away, perhaps. So it would be quite difficult to, uh, particularly if the, uh, if the situation was a surprise and you may be suffering either surprise or startle, uh, which Mike explained earlier on, it would be quite different, uh, difficult to work out that this wasn't the speed from input, this was something else. Um, because you don't actually know what the something else is. Um, you just know that the stabilizer trim is moving and you may or may not be sure why that is. So um, the possibility for confusion is there. What pilots are taught from the word go, really, when they learn to fly is that if you apply a certain amount of power, and you select a certain pitch attitude, you'll get a certain performance. So if you select a 10 degree uh, pitch up and you apply full power, that will give you a climb. And if you select another a three degree nose up and 55% uh, power, that will give you some kind of descent. So 
In this case, the pilots had applied the normal control inputs. They'd put the thrust where it normally went. Um, so their power and their attitude was what they were normally expecting, but the performance wasn't. So the instruments were feeding back to them, the airspeed indicator and the altimeter uh, were different left to right, and they were not necessarily what the crew expected to see. So power plus attitude didn't equal the expected performance in that case. So again, that's a, that's a scratchy head moment. Um, and you can see that the, the conversation and the, the cockpit voice recorder reveals that kind of crew trying to work out what is going on uh, and, and therefore what they need to do next. So it's some confusion to begin with, certainly. Distraction is another issue. Um, there's lots going on. Um, the human being needs to work out what is most important, what to deal with first of all the cues that are coming in uh, to the brain by the sensory systems. Uh, what do you do first? And, and uh, what you do first may not be what's correct to do first. It may just be what grabs the headlines for you. So something that's really loud or something that's, you know, flame shooting out of a uh, a panel underneath the, uh, where, your, where your feet are, that will grab your attention, could distract you from something that's actually more important but doesn't feel like it to you in that moment. So noise is something that's really difficult to put to one side and there are lots of noises deliberately designed on a flight deck to get your attention and make you do something. So the stick shaker is one obvious one. Um, it's meant to, uh, uh, to replicate the buffeting of a, of a stalling aeroplane. And it literally, there's an eccentric motor on the control column, each control column in a 737, and it rattles the, uh, the control column. It's really loud, you'll hear it in a minute. Um, and it's supposed to be attention grabbing. Um, the overspeed clacker, if you exceed uh, VMO or MMO, you'll get an overspeed clacker. It's really loud, it's very attention getting, and it's designed that you should do something about that immediately. The problem is that um, if you get those going off in a regime of flight that you don't normally expect it, you're gonna be surprised or perhaps even startled. Um, and if it's a nuisance warning, so it's not actually, um, you know, the stick shaker going off is supposed to warn you that you're about to stall. Um, but if you're nowhere near a stall and it's a nuisance warning, and it doesn't go away, that can be extremely distracting and, and add that to the confusion that may be going on because of all the cues that you're getting. And you can start to see that pulling out what you need to do and the decisions you need to make gets more and more difficult. So in the case of Lion Air, they had a stick shaker going off for the majority of the 10 minutes that they were airborne for. In the case of the Ethiopian Airlines, they also at some point had the overspeed clacker uh, correctly going off. Um, alongside the stick shaker, and the cacophony is quite something. Um, the control loading, um, Mike talked about um, uh, touch haptic inputs. Uh, you've got some significant control loads that certainly the first officer remarked were, were extremely unusual, and um, he was quite shocked by it, I think, uh, judging by what, what uh, was said on the CBR. Um, and that can also be extremely distracting because you've got a physical exertion. And while you're exerting yourself physically, and you might be trying to lift the equivalent of 50 or 60 kilos, um, that, that is taking all your strength and all your attention to make sure you're doing that. So that in itself is a distraction. And then in this particular case with Lion Air, um, for whatever reason, uh, the crew didn't declare a mayday. Um, maybe they were startled or surprised. Maybe they elected not to do it for another reason. We don't know. Um, uh, the result was that um, uh, air traffic control uh, didn't probably realize what the crew were dealing with. And uh, the crew didn't communicate that to the air traffic controller. So there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of turn, turning uh, instructions and other instructions, which also took uh, attention of the crew away from the situation on board the aircraft. So there was distraction and there was confusion. And all of this is going on while the captain is still trying to work out how am I going to fly this aeroplane? Why is it not flying right? Because it's still not an obvious reason at that stage to that crew why the aircraft was behaving as it was. So here's another video. This is um, just to give you an idea of what the noises sound like. So 
you'll hear a stick shaker, you'll hear a speed clacker, and then you'll hear them both together. Um, and just see how distracting you would find this if this were your working environment. So there's an overspeed clacker. So if you have them both going off together, How easy would it be to do a checklist or to read an instrument or talk to your colleague or do some of the things that you may need to do desperately in order to work out what you need to do next and keep this aeroplane in control. So, as I said, the stick shaker and the speed clacker went off both together for the Ethiopian Airlines one, but the stick shaker was operating for most of the Lion Air flight we're interested in this evening. And it's extremely loud. That is as loud as it is. Uh, the the stick is vibrating in your hand as well, so you've got all of those inputs, and it's very, very difficult to ignore. And indeed, it's designed to be so. There's also a matter we've talked about, the cues that come in from the environment. We've talked about all the decisions that you need to make, the perceptions that you have. Um, this is this was a key one this is the one that everybody um focused on at one point is that the crew this crew this lion air crew didn't know they had a thing on board the airplane called mcas it wasn't in any of the manuals um boeing for for reasons that are published uh decided that it wasn't uh it wasn't something that a flight crew needed to know about so there was no way that uh, the Lion Air crew could have uh, worked out, ah, oh, this is MCAS, because they have no idea what that is. Um, when I went to fly the, the MAX simulator, one of the things that intrigued me was that um, it said the crew had uh, airspeed and altitude differences between left and right sides. And um, I was confused by that because in my view, airspeed and altitude are pressure instruments, and so why would an angle of attack sensor have any bearing on a pressure instrument? And I couldn't understand that. And then it turned out the reason for that was because um, actually somewhere in the bowels of the aeroplane, uh, an angle of attack signal does indeed go to uh, the black box that then displays your airspeed and altitude uh, on uh, the primary flight display in front of you. And so if you've got a, an erroneous angle of attack gauge, it will lead to erroneous airspeed and altitude indications as well on the affected side. So uh, that's indeed uh, the reason that there were airspeed and altitude differences between the, the side with the, the, the defective angle of attack uh, gauge on, or angle of attack sensor on the captain's side and an unaffected side on the first officer's uh, display. So that, that led to some uh, sort of the confusion that they experienced. And again, that's something I didn't know even after 12 or 13 years of flying 737s is that angle of attack does have an input into what you would traditionally think of as a pressure instrument. This is another thing that the, the crew didn't know was that um, if you come from flying the NG as they did and uh, as I do, uh, the, you know that um, if there is a problem with angle of attack sensors, uh, one differs from another by enough, uh, you'll get a caption on the primary flight display that says AOA disagree. Um, and it was intended that the MAX had the same alert. Um, unfortunately, um, for a human reason, uh, the, uh, the AOA disagree alert was linked to an option uh, there are lots of options available, just like when you buy a new car, you can buy lots of options on a, on a brand new 737, one of which is a full-time display of angle of attack. Uh, not many customers choose that option, um, and uh, Lion Air was one of those that didn't choose the option. Um, unfortunately, in the background, the AOA disagree alert had got linked to the full-time AOA display, and it meant that if you didn't order the full-time display, you didn't get the AOA disagree alert either and that shouldn't have been the case. AOA disagree alert should have been standard on all aircraft. Boeing knew about this before the Lion Air accident, but they didn't think it was important enough to do anything about it at that stage, which we might throw our hands up in horror about now, but remember, uh, that's easy for us to say now, 
it made sense to them at the time. It was carefully considered. Um, as it turned out, it was a wrong decision, but they didn't know that at the time. But this crew on the liner aircraft didn't get an AOA disagreement, so they were never going to really focus on the fact that this could be an AOA issue. Um, uh, and if had they maybe got an AOA disagree alert, it might possibly have uh, led them to, to uh, go down that route, examining that. Or it may not, we all never know. Um, here's the, uh, just for, for your information, here's the where the captions come up. This is what the first officer saw fairly shortly after uh, after departure. And you'll see on the, on the CVR and the accident report that he mentions this to the captain that they've got uh, IAS indicated airspeed disagree and an altitude disagree. Um, and had they had AOA disagree, that's where it would have appeared, but um, that area stayed blank. Here then is the, uh, the flight data recorder and uh, some uh, items to note really. The, the top line there is uh, the, um, the captain and then eventually the first officer making. Uh, aircraft nose up trim inputs using the switches on the control wheel and then you can also see there the MCAS commands um, and uh, they're on the on the bottom side of the uh, of the index line there because they're making those down trim inputs so you can see that up until that red vertical line on the right hand side of the slide um, that the uh, pilot nose up commands are about balancing the um, MCAS nose down commands, which is why then you'll see that the nose pitch position stays. It, it varies, but it's essentially varying around a, um, a, around about a five uh, degree line there, and that means the aircraft is staying broadly in trim. Uh, control column force is is reasonable. There's a little bit of a pull, but it's not major, and so the captain is managing to keep the aircraft in control relatively easily. You can also see there. Uh, fourth line down control column that the, the, um, the stick shaker is going off for most of the flight. And um, what you'll see right towards the right hand side there is that that's the point, um, uh, sort of my, my best guess as to where control was handed over from the captain to the first officer. And you'll see that the aircraft nose up trim inputs are much shorter. Um, uh, on the first officer's side than they were on the captain's side. So the first officer isn't making enough nose uh, up trim inputs compared to MCAS is obviously doing the same as it was before. So MCAS is, is, looks pretty consistent in terms of what it was doing, but there's a change in what the uh, pilots were doing when the controls handed over to the FO. And you'll see that the, the pitch trim position starts at five and then eventually there's a burst of MCAS, it ends up about 2.5 degrees on that scale on the stabilizer trim, and then eventually ends up at the forward stop. And at that point, you've got a really big uh, uh, pullback on the control column if you want to stop the aircraft pitching down. Um, that pull was too much. Uh, they couldn't stop the aircraft from pitching down, uh, and the rest we know. Here's a close-up of that point, there, and you can see that where the control handover and, and how the how the trim uh, against MCAS uh, is, is just insufficient. And that's because, uh, if you remember, MCAS trims at twice the speed of, uh, of the pilot. So, I hope you'll see that for this poor crew, um, it was, uh, they, were, they were going to be confused. This was a complicated situation. There was a lot going on. There were noises. There were uh, differences between what the information presented to the captain versus the information presented to the first officer. So confusion and distraction were definitely significant in here. Um, aircraft systems weren't helping. So obviously MCAS uh, in the middle of all of this was trying to trim the aircraft nose down erroneously. Um, and uh, so it wasn't helping the crew uh, to stay con in control of the aircraft, nor was it helping uh, nor was the aircraft really helping them to diagnose what the matter was with the aeroplane. So, you know, had there been an AOA disagreed caption there, maybe that would have helped. But, so the aircraft systems weren't helping either. Um, so hopefully you'll see that that um, while crew after an accident can always, if they survive, they can always work out what they might have done better, and that is not an option available to this poor crew. Um, you can see perhaps why 
they were trying valiantly to do what they thought was best at the time and it just turned out it wasn't enough. And this is why the human factor side to me is so important here is because if we understand that better, how, you know, is there any way that the aeroplane could have helped this crew more or training could have helped this crew more or whatever it might be, um, maybe this accident wouldn't have happened or wouldn't have happened in the way that it did. Um, so the report uh, that was done by uh, the Indonesian authorities uh, with input from Boeing and various others, um, here are the, some of the major conclusions that they came to. Um, they started an airspeed and reliable non-normal checklist. That's that's um, okay, and uh, they didn't identify the runaway stabilizer. This is this is a sort of an old-style comment, really, in that well, what the pilot should have done was identify a, run, a runaway stabilizer, which is very easy for us to say um, on the ground after the event. Um, there's probably quite a few reasons why, and uh, maybe uh, we've explained some of them this evening why they maybe didn't do that. Uh, multiple alerts, definitely. Repetitive MCAS activations, yes. And distractions, so they have, they have uh, uh, started to think about some of the human factors there. Uh, and distractions related to numerous air traffic control communications contributed to the flight cr uh, crew difficulties with aircraft control. I think that's, quite, that's, that's, a, that's a good conclusion for me, that, that is trying to understand what, uh, uh, what was going on in that cockpit and maybe what that crew had to, had to face. And then the one that, that um, I don't think Ed will find any disagreement with is that the design and certification of MCAS was, was inadequate as it turned out. Um, you know, unfortunately, we have to have an accident to learn the lesson. Uh, could we have learned it up front? Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's certainly true. Um, as a result of their investigation, 27 safety recommendations, uh, quite a lot to the FAA, quite a few to Boeing, probably expect that. Lion Air got a number uh, and various other people got some too. Um, there was a, a review done by a number of regulators globally uh, on behalf of the FAA. The FAA recognised that certification of the MAX uh, was a factor in this accident and uh, they did the right thing and, and sort of ordered an independent review and other regulators from across the globe, all the major regulators, contributed to this technical review. Um, top line is an interesting statement there. Compliance with every applicable regulation and standard does not necessarily ensure safety. That's a, an interesting, interesting one to, to think about. So even if you if you abide by all the rules um, and you have a, a Rolls Royce standard, does it mean you're safe? Not necessarily. And I guess the difference there is, you know, have we got enough uh, uh, understanding and enough regulation around the around the human factors side of things? Perhaps not. Um, failure or inappropriate operation of the system with cascading failures, so one thing leads to another, uh, or one thing generates multiple alarms. If that, uh, if, if, a, if a system can, can generate either or both of those, then it's saying the regulator should query how, um, how adequately the certification process considers the impact of that on, you know, with possible startle effect. And, and what that means in terms of how how well a crew is able to deal with the situation that results. So again, that's we're getting towards now thinking not about what a crew should have done better, but saying, look, we understand that if if you're faced with lots of bells and whistles and lights, in addition to uh, control loads that are unusually high and all the rest of it, um, you're going to have a really hard time. And, and should that be allowed? Um, so we're, we're maybe getting somewhere with those kind of conclusions. Um, it does talk about the adequacy of training um, and to help pilots be able to respond effectively to, to failures that they may never have encountered before, not even in training. And, and I, th I think, well, we'll see in the summary, but I think that's, that's another, another key conclusion. Training has got to be a focus because how else are we going to teach pilots, engineers, designers, all the rest of it. And that's, you know, in this case, we're talking about training pilots, but it applies equally to other people involved in the design chain. Um, following the, um, the joint regulators review there, the FAA itself um, put out uh, various um, uh, measures or various orders to deal with 
uh, uh, the things that, that they perceive went wrong with the with the Max 8. Um, so, use of a single angle of attack sensor um, that doesn't happen any, anymore now. Uh, it compares both sides and, and uh, decides which ones uh, which ones right. Um, it's a one-shot system now, so uh, rather than carrying on firing, even when you're trying to uh, to uh, trim against it, um, it, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, if you trim against it once, that's it, finished for the rest of the flight. Um, the uh, trim authority was changed too. Um, safety issue four is the one I'm particularly interested in. Um, because that's the human factor side of it. So a lot of it was just fixing design flaws in MCAS uh, that were, you know, once you realize that you know, uh, single angle of attack sensor, single point of failure, well, that's easily cured when you realize it, isn't it? Um, the human factor is a little bit more difficult, but um, they thought about that under eight uh, emergency checklists that have been revised quite heavily in some cases. As a result, uh, one of those um, particularly is that um, crew can now disable a nuisance stick shaker. So that's a, that to me is a big, a big win that we can turn off now that stick shaker if it's um, and get rid of that distraction if it's identified carefully as, as a nuisance warning. And of course, the AOA disagree message has been updated by software, so that is now standard as it should be on the whole fleet. So the global fatal accident rate for all aircraft has gone down markedly, certainly if you look at it since the sort of 50s, 60s, um, where we're an ever increasingly safe method of transport as commercial air, trans uh, uh, air transports go. Um, so accident rates are declining, but we're getting to a stage now where we've got new threats because we've got, uh, whereas technology has helped us a lot in the last 30, 40, 50 years and has undoubtedly saved a lot of uh, lives, um, as the technology evolves ever more, uh, we're seeing new threats, new kinds of accidents that wouldn't have happened before. And so we're saying that the, the human factors are, are a key part of that and the human in the loop should be a central focus of, of work from here on. So our summary really is, is that, um, as you've seen, I think this evening, loss of control in flight is a leading cause of fatalities, both in large aircraft as we're dealing with here, and, and it's the same uh, in general aviation as well. The small aircraft lock, uh, lock eyes, um, uh, biggest killer of general aviation pilots too, the single cause. Um, human factors are central in the lead up to any kind of loss of control uh, in flight event, because uh, mostly it's still pilots in control of the airplane. Um, both the MAX accidents um, are really good examples of how human behaviour affects flight safety and that's not just human behaviour in flight deck but that's also the human behaviour in regulators, designers, uh, commercial world, all the rest of it. And so our, our plea really is that we, we think more research is needed um, and it's, it's about improving crew training as well. If you remember Mike's slide about you know, all the inputs coming in, it's, uh, it's not just about pilot flying, it's also about pilot monitoring. Uh, each of them has a different role to play and um, we need to work out how best, uh, while we've still got two pilots in an aircraft, um, how we improve the crew training as a whole uh, and the design uh, for what they see and how they, they interact with the aircraft uh, to prevent loss of control events. And thereby we hope learn the lessons of both line there and Ethiopian Airlines. Uh, Mike, I think you wanted to say something about um, some of the research that you're doing, um, which sounds really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, loss of control in flight is, uh, is clearly uh, multifaceted. And um, with, uh, with my uh, research team, we've been looking at prevention intervention strategies as well as recovery strategies. Um, this uh, framework for research was developed uh, some five years ago um, before this event, but um, um, maybe we've made uh, some, some significant progress in some areas, but there's an awful lot more to be done. And I think we have to be cognizant that uh, lock eye is, uh, is, is ever-changing as we introduce new technology 
new levels of automation, then there are new failure modes, obviously, to consider. And uh, with respect to human in the loop, it's absolutely paramount that we consider the scenarios and consider the response of the pilots of the typical level of expected experience that fly these uh, technically uh, challenging and, uh, and uh, advanced uh, aircraft. So there's no silver bullet for this. Uh, it, it requires a, a multifaceted uh, intervention strategy. Um, and we also need to consider that in the event of Lockheed that we also consider recovery strategies that uh, that can take different forms from, from manual recovery through to automated and guided recovery. Um, there are more papers on, on this subject, including some of the uh, framework that we, we talked about earlier and other available through the, uh, the research uh, link. I think that, that concludes the presentation, uh, Niels, and um, 